This video is almost like a culmination of everything that you've learned so far in calculus and also goes back and retrieves information that you learned in college algebra and trig. So this is almost like a summary or, or an interweaving of all these different skills and techniques. Each problem takes a, a long time to get through. The first one, when I show it in class, normally takes the whole hour. Um, next one takes like 35 minutes and the next one takes like 25 minutes, but there's a lot going on. So I have divided them up. So this video is for graphing a polynomial and everything you could possibly do with it and find out about it and analyze. And then it'll be the same on the next video, which is rational and then trig. And so each semester when I have show this to students, I actually show it all to them and then ask them to come up with headings so that they'll remember all the little details that they have to do for each section. It's They're almost 90% the same from semester to semester, but there's like 10% different with their hints. I thought this was a pretty good list. I'm going to add another thing onto it here for polynomials just because, but um, this will be the same list we use for them all. I don't know if you're going to want to take a screenshot of it if you want to print it off or whatever you want to do, but this is what we're going to use. Now for your class or your knowledge or your tests or your homework or whatever when you're studying, your teacher may ask you a subset of any of these. They may go straight down to P and uh, O through Q and, and say, you know, find where it's concave up and down and skip everything in between. They may only want to do the uh, limits. They may only want to do the first derivative test. So everything's in here and you don't have to start at the top and go through every single step. If what you want is the second derivative, you just go straight down there. If what you want is the first derivative, you just go straight down there. But if they're asking you all of this information, this is an organized way to kind of get through it. All right, so let's start off with a problem and We'll start off with the domain and our function is 2x plus 3. I can make that look a little bit better. 2x plus 3 squared times x minus 4. Now, since this is a polynomial, then all polynomials, if you have correctly identified it, its domain is minus infinity to infinity. And so that is just something you would know because domains are normally restricted by what you can't have in the denominator, having square roots, um, a negative power is something in the denominator. So if you don't have any of those restrictions and you know it's a polynomial, then it's just negative infinity to infinity. And if your teacher wants a reason, you go because it's a polynomial. I hope that satisfies them. All right, so then the question of the day is what's an x-intercept? I'm going to put s in parentheses because it could be just one. It could be more than one. Don't want to give anybody a hint as to how many there are. Now, one of the things I'm going to do is right over here to the side what it is that you're actually going to apply to do this upon occasion. So if you're looking for anybody's x-intercept, you always make y be 0. I think you can see that. Okay, so your, your technique or your procedure is to set y is equal to 0. So you would say 0 is equal to 2x plus 3 squared x minus 4. And then you would see where this was equal to 0. So from this first term, you would get x is equal to minus 3 halves, right? Now, this is actually there twice, right? This 2x plus 3 is actually there twice. And so somewhere back in college algebra, you probably learned about multiplicity, which is how many times is something there? And this has a multiplicity of two. This actually had an effect on your graph as to whether it cut through from one side of the x-axis to the other or whether it contacted that x-intercept and then what I called bounce back or reverse direction back onto the same side it was on. Since this is even, since the multiplicity is even, 
it's going to bounce back. Okay, now your teacher may not want all that information, but I'm telling you anyway. And then we have an x is equal to 4, and this is a multiplicity of 1. And since it's odd, 1 is odd, then it's going to cut through to the other side. So it's going to cut through that x-intercept. Now, um, Okay, and then for, I'm going to back up and tell you something in just a second. And then for the y-intercepts, and sometimes on my test, and just in case you have a teacher like me. <laughs> okay, intercepts. All right, I, I put the S in parentheses, but let's talk about that for just a second. Because sure, there can be more than one x-intercept on a function. You know, you can have a a function cross, you know, several different places, and it could have more than one x-intercept. But, y'all, it only has one y-intercept if it's a function. So while there can be multiple x-intercepts, there can only be one y-intercept. But I got in the habit of putting y-intercepts with a possible s there because I had a student tell me one time that they knew what to do because one was singular and one was plural. And I went, okay, you have got to know what to do by its name, not whether it's plural or not. So, but yeah, there's only one y-intercept if it's a function. Good, you know, and then it's going to be, depending on what the function is, you could actually have no y-intercepts, but if you, but you're not gonna have more than one. And then you have as many x-intercepts as it can handle, I guess, this way I put it. So you're gonna set x to be zero. So whichever intercept you want, you set the other variable to be zero. So you would have, going back to our function, you would say y is equal to 2 times 0 plus 3 squared times 0 minus 4. So y would turn out to be negative 36. Now, let, let's talk for just a second, all right? Depending upon the requirements for your course, the book, the the homeworks that you're doing, whether they're online or whatever, sometimes your teacher will let you get away with x's up here. X is minus 3 halves, x is 4, and y is negative 36, and which is sort of um, um, kind of sloppy. It's like a half answer. It answers because everybody has the same body of thought that it's going to cross the x axis x-axis at negative three-halves, for instance, but it's not actually a point. So if your teacher's wanting or the homework's wanting an x-intercept as a point, don't forget that you would have to have this as negative three-halves zero, because remember you set y to be zero, and this would be four zero, and this would be zero negative 36. So everything that I'm showing you today is all totally dependent, as always, on the format that your teacher wants or the homework wants or whatever's going on. Okay, so be careful. One of the things I want to talk about before we move on too far, this is not actually asked in this, but just in case you are asked, sometimes they'll ask you for a polynomial about end behavior. What's it doing on the ends? You know, the far extremes of the graph as opposed to sort of more central. <clears throat> and if you remember the thing called the dominant term, sometimes they call it the lead term. And the way you get it, is you look at the, the highest power term in each factor, which is 2x and x, and this 2x is actually squared, and the other one is just a single power x. So this would be 4x squared times x. This is 4x cubed. So the lead term is 4x cubed. So it's a cubic which means it's going to be of the form where it starts low and ends high, right? Now, that's not normally the way we're going to do this, but, but it's helpful, right? So I do want to bring that up just in case you're asked about it. It's going to possibly help us confirm what we're doing at the end, right? So just in case, here's your minus 3 halves 0. Here's your 4, 0, and here's your 0 minus 36. All right. Now, 
Here we go. So let's talk about symmetry. Again, your class may not care, but your class may. So we're going to put this in here. How do you find symmetry? You substitute a negative x in for x. So your original function was 2x plus 3 squared times x minus 4. So you substitute in the opposite, the negative of the x. <clears throat> and you see if it returns back to the original form. Okay, 2 times a negative x is negative 2x plus 3 squared, negative x minus 4. If it was an exact match, okay, so if this one and this one are an exact match, then it's considered even. See how the E's, you know, each has an E. It's considered even. And even means it's symmetric with respect to the y-axis. And if it's the opposite, if they are true opposites, every sign has been switched, then it's considered odd. See the O's? All right. And that means it's symmetric with respect to the origin. See all the O's? <laughs> okay. Now, this one's neither even nor odd, okay, because... Um, this 2x is now the opposite of minus 2x, but the 3 is still positive. x is now negative, but the negative 4 is still negative, so it's neither even nor odd, so there is no symmetry. And if you need an explanation, you would, you would demonstrate this replacing negative x and then talk about how it's not doing that. Now, we also talked about periodicity. Remember, this was a list we made up for the class and I made up, or the class made up, all right, for everything they were going to do for a test. So since they knew there was going to be some trig, they covered it in here. We don't have uh, periodicity on polynomials, so there is none. Remember, periodicity is if it repeats itself. All right. Now, then we would talk about vertical asymptotes, perhaps. All right, now where do we get vertical asymptotes? We get vertical asymptotes from restrictions on the domain where you can't have, typically from something that's in the denominator but uh, that we're not allowed to have. So this one has no vertical asymptotes because it's a polynomial. So if you need an explanation, you would say it has none because it's a polynomial. Polynomials are continuous from negative infinity to infinity, so I don't have any stops and starts. Now. If you look at the list that we have somewhere up in here, right? Vertical asymptotes, if so, demonstrate limits. Your teacher may very likely say, if you have a vertical asymptote, you're going to talk about the limits on either side. That'll be in the next video, okay? So we don't have to do that part for G, for horizontal asymptotes. This has none. So I don't have to explore the limits there either. And then we're going to move on to the first derivative test so that we can talk about where it's increasing and decreasing and potential max and mens, all that good stuff. All right. So remember, our function was 2x plus 3 squared times x minus 4. So this is going to be the product rule. So the first derivative is the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. So you bring the two down, leave the inside alone, 
take one off the power loop back in and take the derivative of the inside. <clears throat> and you could multiply all this out, which I've seen students do, but typically they can't refactor it back down at that point because, it, it, I don't know. Anyway, they just don't. Okay, so your best bet is to look at it and say, oh, look, there is a 2x plus 3 in both terms because this is just really two terms. Okay, this is the first term. This is the really long convoluted second term because pluses and minuses, this one right here, makes space. So we've got, it's like words, you know. So I'm going to factor out a 2x plus 3 and see if that helps a little bit because that's the smaller one. So out of the first term, I would still have a 2x plus 3 left. And out of the second term, I would have this 2 times 2 is 4. And I would have 4 times x minus 4, which simplifies my multiplication quite a bit. Because I need factors for this first derivative. You either need factors or you need a quotient. So you'd have 2x plus 4x is 6x. And 3 minus 16 is minus 13. So this is your first derivative. Now on i, we're going to talk about the critical values, critical points, critical values for c. Um, whatever your teacher uses for their terminology, I guess would be the word, in, in a sign chart. I've, I've shortened it down just to here. All right. So to do that, we take the first derivative and we set it equal to 0. And the critical values or the locations or whatever would be where each one's equal to 0. So x is minus 3 halves and x is 13 6. Okay, so then we'd have a little sign chart. We have to put them in proper order so the negative 3 halves would come first if it was on a number line and 13 6 would be over here. That gives us three sections, the part to the left of negative 3 halves, the part between negative 3 halves and 13 16 and the part to the right of 13 16 And you would use a test point <coughs> excuse me, you would use a test point to the left of negative 3 halves, so that's negative 1 and a half, you could use negative 2. Between negative 3 halves and positive 13, 6, I love 0 because the math is much easier. And then on the right of 13, 6, that'd be like, it's a 2 and a 6, so maybe 3. Okay, so those could be your test points. And so what you would do is, remember, you would generate some sort of a, sometimes maybe you could do these in your head. And I don't know what your teacher wants. I hope that orange is colors. I was thinking it might be better than the red, but I'm not sure about that. Or maybe, anyway. We're stuck with this for the moment. So if x is negative 2, right, then what you're looking for is what's going on in each one of these factors. So 2 times negative 2, because remember we're substituting them in there, okay? So, well, yeah. We're not actually substituting them into the equals to 0. We're actually substituting it in as the first derivative, but since that's the formula that's right next to it, we're actually into there. But most people that I've talked to when they're actually telling me what they did, they just look at the one where they set it up equal to zero. All right, so two times negative two is negative four plus three is negative. And six times negative two minus 13 is gonna be negative. So the result is positive. So this is going to be all positive numbers. Then you would pick 0. 2 times 0 plus 3 is positive. 
6 times 0 minus 13 is negative. So this is negative. All the values in there are negative. And 3, 2 times 3 plus 3 is positive. And 6 times 3 minus 13 is positive. So this is positive. Because remember, we don't need a number. We just need to know if it's positive or negative. And if it's positive on the first derivative test, that says the slopes are positive. It's increasing, it's negative, it's decreasing, and then it's increasing. So if you look, you kind of have this system right there going on. Okay? All right. Now, so the critical points or critical values, and if your teacher said find all the values for C and you don't change it to C, they should take off points because you got almost there, but then you dropped the ball just before you finished. Because if somebody says, I want to know what C is, and you tell them what X is, they're like, well, is that C? So you have to complete the assignment. Now, if you look at these points, so I'm, I'm, while I'm sitting here, I'm going to do a little bit of math, right? Uh, but I'm going to use it later, All right? So I'm going to do just a little bit of math. So when x is minus 3 halves, can you see how you sort of have a peak right here? So I wonder what's going on there. So when x is minus 3 halves, w there's a point on the curve itself that we could that looks like it's going to be a maximum, right? So if I want the point then I don't substitute it into the derivative formula. I substitute it into the original one, which was f of x is equal to 2x plus 3 squared x minus 4. So substituting x is equal to minus 3 halves in there, I get y is equal to 0, which makes sense because putting it in there zeroes out everything. And if you put x is equal to 13 6 in there and you do a lot of math, which I'm not going to take the time to do a lot of fractions for you, you get negative 26, 62 over 27. At that time, you're like, okay, <laughs> that's a little weird. All right, but you can check a lot of this on your calculator or your Desmos or whatever. So I'm going to just leave that there for just a second and leave it kind of sitting there. And we're going to continue on. And so on part J, it talked about where is this function increasing, right? Well, it's increasing where the first derivative is telling you the values are positive. So the slopes would be positive. So it's increasing to the far left, negative infinity to negative 3 halves. And then it starts increasing again at 13, 6 and on. See? So it's increasing here and here. All right? So it's decreasing everywhere else. So that would be between negative 3 halves and negative uh, positive 13, 6. Now, y'all, this is not a point, okay? This is an interval. Sometimes it's like, okay, wait, is that a point or is that an interval? It's kind of easy to tell when you have an infinity up there. But this is an interval. This is saying between negative 3 halves and 13, 16, 13, 6, beg your pardon, I am decreasing, all right? Now, where is there a minimum? Or do you have a minimum? <clears throat> and is it local or absolute? Well, so the minimum is this bottom of the valley right here, and that was at 13, 6. So this would be 13, 6, minus 26, 
62 over 27. Now, I know it's a minimum, right? Don't know if it's going to be absolute or a local. You kind of actually do, but um, let's go ahead and talk about it now instead of waiting until we graph it. So you remember when we talked about the end behavior and we said it's going to start low like a cubic. Remember, it's of the form of a cubic. There's a cubic like that. So if it goes down forever, there is no minimum. There's no absolute minimum because it keeps going down and down and down and down and it also keeps going up and up and up. So there is no absolute max and there's no absolute min. So this is a local minimum. Right? And then for M, where we're talking about the maximum, Right, so the maximum happened up here where we had this top of this little mountaintop right here. So that happened at negative three halves, zero. And since we know that it's going to go up forever, there is no absolute max, so it's also a local maximum. All right, now, then we're going to do the second derivative. It's a lot of work for one problem in it. <laughs> but if it's the only one on your test, this is huge. You know, so for my students, this is, this is 30 points. Okay, so they're like really, really intense. All right, now the first derivative just to remind ourselves since it's way back up there. It was 2x plus 3 times 6x minus 13. Okay, so the second derivative would be the first times the derivative of the second, which is 6, plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is two. So this turns out to be 24x minus eight. All right, then we want the critical points, critical values, critical whatever your teacher calls them, and a sign chart. I abbreviated that a little bit. All right, so you set this up equal to zero, and x turns out to be one third. So here's your sign chart. And so I need a test point to the left of one third, so zero is a good choice, and then one's a good choice. So we're gonna do zero and one. So remember, we're testing it actually up into here. Even if you look over here where it's set up equal to zero because it's adjacent, you're actually setting them up into here. And so 24 times zero minus eight is going to be negative. And 24 times one minus eight is going to be positive. So on the second derivative test, it talks about the concave concavity. And if it's negative, it's concave down. And if it's positive, it's concave up. Okay? All right. And since it flipped from concave down to concave up, right in here, it has an inflection point. If it went from concave up to concave up on the other side, there is no inflection point. Now, so we're going to have to come up with this number eventually because they're asking about it. So let's, I guess, go ahead and do that while we're here. If we wanted to know what that point was, this is our, this is the answer to the current question. If we wanted to know what the inflection point was, we would say x is equal to one third and we would sub substitute it back into the original equation because we want a point on the curve, not a point on the second derivative curve or a point on the first derivative curve. We want it on the original curve. And when you do this, 
<coughs> excuse me, you get y is equal to negative 1331 over 27. So the inflection point is actually one third negative 1331 over 27. But we're going to answer it when it's asked for because we we're just following the little chart they set up. So where is this concave up? Now, so it is concave up to the right of one third. So it's one third to infinity. And you use the little round curve as opposed to the squared off ones because at that point it's neither concave up nor down. It's switching. So that's where it's concave up. Q is where is it's concave down. And it's concave down to the left of one third. So that would be negative infinity to one third. And did it have any inflection points? Yes, it had one because it switched. So that was, we found it already, one third to negative 13, 31, 27. And then always remind people to graph because you get so involved with all this that it's really sometimes hard to do. Now, what I would like to do is to sort of redraw these for just a second where you can kind of see how far apart your first and second derivative sign chart is. All right, let's kind of back this up. So on the first derivative, all right, we had negative three halves and we had 13 six and it went increasing, decreasing, increasing, right? And on the second derivative, our critical point was at one third, which is, I don't know, not that far over, probably somewhere right, right in there. Okay, and it's concave down and concave up. All right, so what is this going to do for us? All right, so let's try to fit all that in and let's try to graph not drawn to scale okay now what we know is that at negative three halves it's actually an x-intercept and we also know that it's multiplicity of two and it's going to bounce but we know that it's increasing okay it's curving up this direction. So it's curving up like this, not like that. Okay, it's concave down, so it's curling downward as opposed to upward, right? So we're going to do the best we can to curl kind of like this. It's sort of an artistic license on your part. I'm not a great artist. All right, so it's going to be kind of curling up like that, and then it bounces because this had a multiple this x intercept had a multiplicity of two so it's like bouncing a wall against a, a bouncing a ball against a wall it's going to hit there and then it's going to come back now where is it going to come back it's going to come back to our um, y intercept right and our y intercept is 0 negative 36 this is not drawn to scale if i drew it to scale it'd be way off the chart <laughs> Okay, so this is going to be 0, negative 36, right? So I'm going to try to do this a little bit better. So it would kind of curl like this. That's the best I can do. All right, now where's the next point? One third. So at one third, that's really way big. If down there is negative 36, way, you know, X scale and Y scale is not at all close. It's going to flip. So at one third 
and whatever this negative 13, 31, okay, one third negative 13, 31 over 20 sevenths is give or take one third and negative 49.2, give or take, okay? So it's past this negative 36, so it's gonna be kind of like down here. So this is concave down to here. This is the inflection point. So this is one third negative 13, 31 over 27. And then it's gonna flip and go concave up. So then it starts curling. I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but it curls downward with this concave down, flips right here and goes concave up. All right, so we're following these two paths. So see it goes concave up right here at one third. It's going to flip and go concave up. See how I've kind of worked these two together, All right? So then it's going to go to this 13, six, which is my minimum or local minimum. And then it's going to come back up. This is not drawn to scale, y'all. And this is the x-intercept four zero. And this is 13, six, negative 26, 62 over 27. Now, why am I doing these weird fractions as opposed to these decimals? Well, Traditionally, if your teacher doesn't, or the um, calculator or whatever, or the homework doesn't say to round it off to a particular point, then it's, it's actually assumed. It's always asking for exact, unless they tell you differently, right? And so exact is this negative 2662 over 27, which is actually 136 negative 98.59, but if it doesn't ask me to approximate to the nearest hundredth or the nearest tenth or whatever, we're not actually supposed to be doing that. So you would leave them as these very bizarre looking fractions that really my mind does not have a physical grasp of, I guess, as to how far that distance is. I'm, I'm more comfortable with, oh, that's almost a hundred units down. This was almost 50 units down. But so I have a better physical grasp of that, but it's not exact. Okay, so this is exact, and this is what I think my graph is sort of semi like. And if you look at it, remember how we talked about the end behavior at the beginning, and we said since its lead term is odd and positive, then it starts low and goes high, which it did, and I feel that makes me feel kind of good. And then, of course, you can always get out your calculator, plot it look up all these points, okay? Look up all these points. It almost looks like it's negative, but it's not. Okay, look up all these points and see um, what it tells you. And of course, your calculator is gonna round it off most likely to a decimal, unless you've got something different going on. Anyway, there's polynomials. The next video is going to be a rational function. So don't forget to like and subscribe. And um, I hope, I'll see you at the next video. Good luck.